Hi, I'm Ted London, Vice President at the William Davidson Institute and faculty member at the Ross School of Business at the University of Michigan. And today I'm with David Griswold, the President and Founder of Sustainable Harvest. David, thanks for taking the time to talk. Thanks for having me. You founded Sustainable Harvest in 1997, so it's coming on you know, almost two decades. Can you talk a little bit about the early history and development of, of the company? Absolutely. So when I got into coffee, I, I decided I would get right into the middle of the value chain. I would become a coffee importer because I wanted to help growers, and I also felt like this was a good vantage point to be able to scale the work of buying coffee from farmers and then returning premiums back to them to help them with training and education so they could be actors, equal actors in the coffee supply chain. So the company I have, Sustainable Harvest, is a coffee importer, at least on the surface. But because of the training and education it does, it acts much like a, a development organization would. And because of the way I always embrace technology with iPads and products like that on um, how would we take information and get apps out to farmers so they could assess their crop or taste their coffee or share information, we sometimes seem like a technology company. So within the coffee world, Sustainable Harvest has become this, this unusual breed of a coffee importer that continually innovates to help invest back in farmers. And um, just to give you a sense of scale, our company started off just by myself in 1997, and we've grown to about 50 employees, six offices overseas, and we have sales of about $50 million a year of what, coffee purchases. And that means that we're doing about one out of every six pounds of organic fair trade coffee that's sold in North America. So we've been able to scale this model. Um, one last thing I think that really represents Sustainable Harvest is the radical transparency we tried to drive into this coffee supply chain. I felt early on that if farmers could understand what the playbook is, what the rules are of how to engage as global actors in business, they would be much more quick to adapt to the right coffees, to the right markets, and to understand what their role was to essentially empower them. And by doing that, you had to be completely transparent. So my growers, the suppliers who provide us with coffee, needed to know my customers, the roasters I sell to. And by doing that, and by letting people know, here's what all the margins are, here's how we're going to um, cooperate and collaborate, I've been able to scale a, a business model that we call relationship coffee. And the idea of relationship coffee is that all the actors know each other, <clears throat> they converse together, they collaborate together, and, um, and they move the product forward and, and deal with all the problems in a, in a very common way with everybody adding resources to the conversation. And it's quite unusual in commodity chains. So you're a, a large, relatively large company. You're, you're successful and you, you're basing a lot of your growth on continual innovation. And, and something I know that you're innovating around is a new program in Rwanda. Can you talk a little bit about that and how that's come to be? Yeah, um, we, uh, we received some support from Bloomberg Philanthropies, that's Michael Bloomberg, the former mayor of New York, who asked us to see if we could take this relationship coffee model and apply it to a really astounding number of people, 3,500 women who were very poor and were not coffee farmers in Rwanda. Could we take this model of training and investment and teaching them how to, how to play the coffee game, the global coffee game, and raise their incomes? Could we actually improve their lives? So we took the challenge on. And in Rwanda now, we are um, we're doing a lot of things. We are helping women become coffee farmers. We are working with government to get coffee lands donated so the women can have coffee trees. But more importantly than that, we work it now side by side with government to sort of show them, here's how we do our program. Here's how we innovate. Here's how we use technology. And we actually go hand in hand with the agronomists from the government and go out into the fields and, and implement our projects. But we went beyond that. On top of that, we said, let's create more value. And we look at value creation in a couple of ways. One was, could we move them up the, what we consider the value chain of where the margins are higher? So instead of just delivering coffee raw in the cherry form, because coffee is something like a cranberry, if you look at it, it's got a, a cherry around it, let's have the processing station owned by the women and return the premiums from that aspect back to the women. And then we took it another step. We started to say, let's get roasting done in the capital city of Kigali. Let's roast coffee and let's sell that coffee locally to the hotels, to the game parks, to uh, other organizations. So the roasted added value could also come back as premiums to the women. And then we started a cafe. 
um, called the Question Coffee Cafe, where people can go in and learn more about the program, but also the, um, the women can see where their final product um, ends up, and they're part of that. So there's the level of value we've created in this project around just how much more income we have, and I can explain um, how we use those premiums. But there's also the value creation of women becoming participants and really business leaders in their community and understanding how to make sales projections. They're now empowered that even if the project stopped tomorrow, they have forever been changed in how they see themselves. And that's a creation of value that we hadn't perceived before we started the project. As you think about this, you've got a, uh, an enterprise that you've started in Rwanda. And you know, it's connected in some degree to the larger organization, but it's also separate. Can you talk about sort of the structure that you've developed to run this uh, initiative in Rwanda and how it fits into the bigger picture of, of sustainable harvest? The need to structure differently happened because of the Bloomberg grant. Pre prior to that, I had always just created a social enterprise. I would add premiums to my, my fees, and those premiums would go back into what is seen as charitable work, um, training farmers, educating farmers, and, and the things that we did. When we received this grant, we had to set up a separate entity, a 501c3 nonprofit called the Relationship Coffee Institute. And the purpose of that institute is to bring the relationship coffee model to coffee, but also to other supply chains and raise the income of people by making them um, great business people and understanding how they can be global actors in the global business markets. But we start, we are working with people at the very base of the pyramid. When I, um, by structuring it this way, we've set up a, an entity in Rwanda that's an NGO, and it also has, there's also a social enterprise for the roasted coffee and the, and the value creation services. So we're learning as much about legal systems and how to create um, strong, strong ways to, to carry out the work we want to do, but also to allow the funding and the resourcing of our projects to work more efficiently. Now you've been at this two years or so in Rwanda. You've, the, the women have been engaged, they've now sold coffee. What are some of the outcomes so far from the project? The first big outcome for me was that we took on a project that I was really um, quite stunned by the scale and scope that we were going to have to achieve. I mean, 3,500 women, now we're at 4,000 women, going through an agronomy training program, taking 1,000 people and certifying them as, as coffee farmers. Just the scope of that took quite a, that was quite an undertaking, and we have a great staff um, over there taking them through and they break down into 60 or so groups and, and there is constant training and a train the trainers program. Many things that we see in, in great projects um, all over the world and we try to adapt the best in, pra in class practices to what we do. But so, so the scope of getting 4,000 women now to move from about 77 cents a day in their in their wages is what they were getting to increase that by about 30 or 40 percent it looks like. Um, that was dramatic because we're really looking at um, extreme poverty and moving people up. So we've had some dramatic increases in income. But perhaps the most important is the, is the sense of community and, and, and collective action that the women have had because they were separate before the project started. Now they're formed in these things called premium sharing groups. They work together. They built washing stations and processing centers together. And that part is really one of the biggest outcomes that I think is why everybody's looking at what's happening in Rwanda and saying, can we take it elsewhere? So this premium sharing group, I mean, it, it's, a, it's a new model of sort of, as I understand it, for figuring out how to distribute benefits more equitably based on how much people contribute. Can you talk a little bit about that? In our discussions with, with the, um, the women participants, there was some pushback to just forming cooperatives because there have been some difficulties with cooperatives not just in, in Rwanda, but throughout Africa. And also we see that with, uh, we're primarily with cooperatives all around the world. And there's nothing wrong with cooperatives, but we wanted to add something more about how can the individual person who works um, more diligently, works a little harder, produces a little bit higher quality, how could they get rewarded? And this was something that came from our understanding of what the roasters, the people we sell the coffee to, they want to reward the people who are producing the finest coffees. And within some systems, that becomes difficult because it may be so democratic that it's just everybody gets the same wage. So we developed this program called Premium Sharing Rewards. And it was based on the concepts that many of us are familiar with, with our airline rewards or our credit card rewards program. But how would you get points? We decided the women would decide what are their key performance indicators 
for the group, what kinds of things did they want to reward? Was it quality? Was it participation? Was it leadership? We let them decide. And then they could turn those key KPIs into points. So they could say, this is worth five points, this is worth 10 points. Okay, big deal, right? You have points, but what can the points buy? Then we started to look at our base of the pyramid um, uh, opportunities for products and assets, things like solar lamps, clean water drinking straws, um, things that would uh, improve health. There's many, many products that are, that are created at the base of the pyramid. And how could we put those into a rewards catalog? So now we had points and we had rewards, but who was going to pay for it? And that's where the value creation part came in. By selling the roasted coffee, both locally and then internationally, and even into Bloomberg's offices with their 6,000 employees, the money made from that roasted coffee went back into the premium group, into the reward sharing program, and the women began to earn, earn assets and improve the households that they lived in through coffee and through their hard work, as well as becoming part of, a, of a, essentially a cooperative of women. So it kind of brought the best of both worlds. I know that something that you mentioned earlier was the establishing in Rwanda the Question Cafe. And I know that's something that you're thinking about uh, more broadly uh, with the new brand. Can you talk a little bit more about that as well? What we found was that the, the marketplace of coffee, we felt, needs some sort of brand that consumers can look at where there's a collaboration of an entire supply chain towards a social good. Not just, um, not just a sticker or a stamp on a, on a particular coffee, but that every part participant in the supply chain could be, um, it could be a strong social enterprise, could be something that consumers could know. This, this product has integrity through and through, kind of from seed to cup. And the important part of that is, um, is to think about what is the consumer's final experience of that, and that's in the brand. So we worked with, um, with a lot of our partners, including our roaster partners and our barista partners and, and, and the people that make coffee machines and said, let's put a cafe in Kigali called Question Coffee that kind of brings to, brings to fruition all of the components of what we're trying to tell consumers about what we do. But if we tell people what we're doing, that can be a very uncomfortable experience. If you walk into a cafe and people just tell you this is sustainable because of this and this is how it's grown. So we decided let's, let's go with more of um, a questioning approach. Let's, let's ask questions of the consumer. Do you know that women in Rwanda produce coffee? Did you know that this coffee had a 90 point score? And let the, the answers come back if they want to know more and really engage the consumers. So the Question Coffee Cafe is really our first effort to build a brand that consumers can walk into and say, I know I'm making a difference, but it's also just a delicious cup of coffee that has very deep impact. And you've taken this beyond Rwanda, this Question Coffee, right? We launched it in, the, in some supermarket stores, some grocery stores in Portland, Oregon mm -hmm. to see how consumers there would, would like it. Mm -hmm. And what we learned was, um, you know, it's a very crowded marketplace. Mm -hmm. This isn't something you can just come in and, and especially with a cause-related product mm -hmm. or a give-back product. We're still having more questions than answers as we, as we look at this. But I think the core of what we're trying to do is strong and that's been uh, borne out in the, in the sales data in just the first three weeks mm -hmm. in Portland, Oregon. That People are inquisitive. There is a huge generation of young people who want to have more questions answered than be told what to think. And they like to go online and learn about things. And we think this is a brand that if growers could benefit from this globally, um, and what I mean by that is that if this, if this brand could actually kick proceeds and premiums back to farmer training, that would be, um, that would be a really great brand to have in the marketplace. So as you kind of look ahead, you know, sustainable harvest, a successful mid-sized company doing well. You've got a new initiative in Rwanda that's, that's very innovative. And then within that, you know, you've got a new program, the premium sharing model, and then kind of a spin-off, you're developing a, a new brand of coffee that's coming out of Rwanda and then beginning to enter the U.S. Well, thinking about across all of those, what, what's new or different in the coming years that we might see from Sustainable Harvest as these all sort of develop their own different momentum or their integrated momentum? A couple of things come to mind. First of all, I think by taking such a bold step into trying to brand uh, a product that, is a, that will bring more impact to farmers and doing it through a consumer instead of a B2B play but a mm -hmm. B2C, 
we are, um, we're upsetting the Apple, Apple cart in some ways. So we are going to see some challenges from even our own customers of, aren't you competing with us? And we will have to, f to find a way that our customers, who are the roasters, can be part of this, that this can really be a co-collaboration. Things like you hear pre-competitive collaboration. This is a great chance for us to see, can we all really join hands to create some, some kind of tool that gives consumers a chance to really give back to sustainability in the supply chain? Um, this isn't at the expense of the roaster's profits, but maybe an addition that they can have, an additional brand extension that says, this is what I'm doing. But this is not going to be easy, um, because whenever you bring something brand new to the marketplace, that's part of it. The other aspect I would say is, from Sustainable Harvest, you're going to see a, a stronger push towards a fully integrated, sustainable supply chain. And we're looking at the B Corporation model as doing that. And B Corporation is a certification that's for business, much the way fair trade and organic is for coffee. B Corporation is for how you run your business. And it uh, requires you to assess yourself across environment and social and your employees. And it really tells you how you're doing as a business. And I became a B Corp in 2008. And you actually change your bylaws to say in your corporate DNA, I'm going to make decisions not just on making profit, but on stakeholders, things like consumers and employees and things like that. So it's kind of a flag to everyone that I'm, I really am going to walk the talk. B corporations are popular in the United States and in many northern countries, but they hadn't really been taken in a, in a, in a supply chain model to the supply side, to the growers. So in the question coffee that we did in Portland, Oregon, we got the growers to actually take the assessment. We got the firm that did the branding to actually take the assessment. The, the, the grocery store was already a B Corp. We were, and so was the roaster. So here's this chain that as a consumer, you drink this coffee, you know that every single entity in the chain is taking care of, for example, its employees. It's looking at how many women are in leadership positions. It's looking at what's the price between the highest paid CEO and the lowest paid employee. These are important questions for, for many consumers. And here was this tool. So that's a very exciting part that I can see myself pushing the, the idea of a, a fully integrated and in a supply chain with integrity that consumers can count on. And that's what that brand of Question Coffee is just on the cusp of telling the world. Interesting. And sort of as you've now looking back, you've been at this 20 years or so, you've had a variety of different experiences. And it's probably difficult to summarize, but you know, at a high level, if someone would ask you, what is it that I should know if I'm interested in you know, becoming an entrepreneur with an interest in kind of base of the pyramid and sustainability, what advice would you give them? The first piece of advice is that it's important to learn all the aspects of the business that you might be trying to get into. That it's, you can't just jump right in and become president of a company. Um, my own journey took a long time and it was many years of working alone and doing everything from being mailroom to you know, doing the invoices to the shipping documents to the marketing materials. And many entrepreneurs understand that is the reality. That's how it all starts. Um, and so it's no different in base of the pyramid enterprises. Your goals may be laudable, but the hard business that you have to do to just create a business is going to be always there. And even more so, if you're contributing back towards social or environmental um, causes, you, the business is even that much harder because some of the value that you create is going to the mission that you have. So the first thing is um, understand you need, to under, you need to get involved in all aspects of the business. You probably have to start in maybe the section that doesn't look quite perfect right. at, at your career point, but really understand it. In my own personal experience, almost all of my employees have started off as, as fellows or interns because it's been a chance for us to assess how do they do, um, whether they're older or younger, it's a great way for us to understand do they really fit into our, our company culture. And then finally, it's about persistence. It's about really believing enough in what you, what you want to create in the world that you continue to ask questions. And, um, and when you get some answers to those questions, it only means that you're just getting closer and then you'll have more questions to fall after that. And uh, you have to be comfortable with the unknown and the uncertainty. So I see the link back to Question Coffee. <laughs> well, hopefully, hopefully that does seem to be a driver in my own life. Uh, a farmer asked me a question, how can you help us? And that set me off on my life's adventure. And I'm sure every entrepreneur has a question they're trying to answer. Well, David, thank you for taking the time to talk today. Thank you.